Good afternoon. It is a delight to be here in this absolutely gorgeous uh, city. I've actually never been here. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan, so I'm having a great time. Um, I've got about six hours collectively of sleep in the last 72 hours, so, um, <laughs> and it's 6 a.m. for me. Um, so I am here uh, to talk to you about gender equality in technology. And I've been listening to this fabulous slate of speakers um, and their impressive coding credentials. I am not one of them, uh, but I am a scientist. And I am gonna sprinkle in and talk about the science behind why we might be seeing the lack of representation that we see across the industry. Now, I don't know about the UK, but I suspect it's much the same as the United States. And that is that gender equity has suddenly become headline news. You can't pick up a newspaper in the States without seeing something about a scandal like Gamergate or high profile gender discrimination lawsuits and venture capital or tech companies falling like dominoes when they're forced to release their, tech, their diversity stats, which aren't looking really very good. It's about 20% women in technology and as you move up through the, the leadership ranks, that number plummets. So I live and work in the San Francisco Bay Area, and as I said, I am a scientist. So I've experienced many of the issues that women experience in technology firsthand. But my particular story with women in technology goes back a long, long time before the current media frenzy. See, my dad was a rocket scientist. <laughs> That's him playing Dr. Strangelove on one of the missiles that he designed. It was the 1960s. And he worked in a laboratory that was absolutely full of male physicists and engineers and their female secretaries, except for one lone female engineer. And my dad absolutely held her in the highest regard. So I got the message early on that being a scientist or an engineer was a cool thing for a woman to be that I could be anything that I wanted to be, and if that happened to end up being a scientist or engineer, my dad would be pretty darn proud. But I also got another message growing up. A lot more subtle, but perhaps a lot more profound. And that was that every Christmas or birthday, my brother got something from this catalog. Now, I'm dating myself here. So for those of you who don't know what a Heath kit is, it was kind of the original maker kits for electronics enthusiasts. So he'd get something from that catalog, and after he got it, he'd happily disappear with my dad to his workshop to solder away making circuit boards for hours, and I'd get more girl-appropriate toys, like clothing and crafting supplies. Now, to be fair to my dad, I never asked him for a Heath kit. I just intuitively knew that this wasn't something made for girls. I'll leave it to your imagination how I might have figured that out. But this picture is the crux of our story today. Now, fast forward a few years, I ended up becoming a scientist. I went to UC Berkeley, and I was largely unprepared for the onslaught of sexism I was about to face. An example of this was that at Berkeley, they had three levels of physics. We had physics for physicists, I mean, the real physics, physics for biological majors, and physics for liberal arts majors, which was widely known at that time as physics for girls because it didn't require math. I'm super good at math, so I headed straight over here for physics for physicists, and I found myself in a lecture hall surrounded only by men, which frankly, at age 18, being a heterosexual female was not a problem. <laughs> And I did really well on the theoretical portions of that class, until one day I walked into the laboratory and there was a pile of stuff that looked like this on the counter, and a set of instructions that might as well have been written in Swahili. I was forced to ask for help, as I watched all the men in the room happily soldering away, because they'd gotten heath kits. I immediately became the poster child of why girls didn't belong in real physics. So I want to pause here for a second and ask a few questions. Why would my dad, a vocal advocate of women in science and technology, fail to give me a Heath kit? Why would I, 
An intellectually curious young girl not ask for one. And why would these guys in physics lab so easily make this gigantic logical leap from doesn't know how to use a soldering iron to doesn't belong in physics? The unifying factor in all three of these questions is what we're here to explore, unconscious bias. Now, I graduated in 1985. And despite the kinds of overt sexism that was really common back then, this was actually a time of optimism for women. In the United States, we were the first generation in history where female college graduates outnumbered men. We were flooding into the marketplace, and we naively thought that our generation was going to be the ones that would put gender inequality into the past. But sadly, it's 30 years later, and the conversation remains much the same. Now, you all work in the tech industry, and all you have to do is look around this room for the evidence. The numbers are pretty bad. This picture from last year's Apple Developers Conference pretty much sums up the story. Uh, it's pretty much the only place where I have uh, quick access to a bathroom during a conference. But what you might not know is that the numbers are actually moving backwards in technology, not forwards. The year I graduated from college was the year that computer science, science graduates, female graduates, peaked. It peaked around 38%. And it's been on a steady decline ever since. You might also not know how dramatically low the numbers of women are in a variety of other key roles in society. For example, only 4.7% of Fortune 500 CEOs are female. The FTSE has 17 male CEOs named David and five female CEOs total. There are only five countries globally where women account for more than 20% of board seats in publicly held companies. The UK is one of, those one of those countries, the United States is not. In venture capital, only 6% of venture cap capital partners are female. Women receive 2.7% of venture funding, and if you happen to be a black female, that number is 0.1%. In government, only 6% of countries globally have ever had an elected female head of state. And here's the real interesting one for me. It might not seem relevant, but when you think about it, you can make all sorts of arguments for the underrepresentation in those other categories. But women are 50% of the population, so we should arguably be 50% of the roles in films, right? Because films just tell the story of humanity. And yet, Last year, women only accounted for 12% of lead roles in major motion pictures. These numbers are dismal, but there are a lot of people who don't find this to be a problem. And the reason they typically don't is that they think, well, in the industrialized world, women have equal ed education or access to education. We've outlawed a lot of the overt forms of discrimination. So if they're not showing up in these roles, it must be because they're not interested. Now, if you happen to fall into that camp, I hope you see the world a little bit differently by the end of this talk. But aside from social justice and fairness, there are a whole host of reasons why it might behoove us to mind the gap. First and foremost, there's abundant evidence that empowering and elevating the voices of women worldwide is the quickest way to alleviate poverty. Many uh, studies on business performance, Catal uh, Catalyst, Deloitte & Touche, McKinsey, Credit Suisse, the World Bank, the United Nations, the list goes on and on, have looked at the effect of women on the bottom line. And the results are inarguable. Those companies that have more women in their boards of directors and in top leadership significantly outperform the competition in every measure that business cares about. Catalyst, for example, looked at those companies that have the highest representation of women on boards versus those that have the lowest and found that they outperform the competition by 42% in sales and 66% on return on investment. MIT did a study looking at group intelligence and found that the highest correlation was the number of women in the group and the degree of inclusivity of the conversation. And those two things, in fact, are cross-correlated. 
We all know that innovation is tied to the diversity of voices in the conversation. And of course, from a sheer design prospect, it makes sense to include a constituency that consists of 50% of the population in your design decisions. So if there's so many good reasons for doing this, why isn't it happening? I mean, why aren't there more women? Well, again, there are a couple of responses that people have in a sort of a knee-jerk way, and both of them have some truth. One is that women become mothers, and it's inarguable that this is a factor. But our thinking here hasn't kept up with the demographic reality. In the United States, fully 50% of the labor pool is female, and 40% of primary wage earners are female. So we can't really say there's less than 5% CEOs in the Fortune 500 because they're not in the labor pool. The second is the pipeline argument, which says that women simply haven't been in these professional roles long enough to have matriculated up through the system into leadership. But again, we find in careers like medicine and law, where for a few decades women have been roughly equal in terms of the numbers, there's still a precipitous drop-off when you get into top leadership. But these two explanations leave out a powerful and invisible actor in our story. All of us, male and female, are unconsciously gender biased. And these biases cause well-meaning men and women to do things that are out of keeping with their own values and that maintain the status quo without their ever knowing that they've done so. And until we get our arms around this phenomenon and learn how to elevate these biases so that we can see them, we become unwitting accomplices in the perpetuation of inequity and discrimination. So let's take a look at these brain processes, how they show up, and most importantly, what we can do about them. There's a central design feature of your brain that underpins this entire conversation, and that is that very little of what you do is the process, is the result of a conscious process of deliberation. You couldn't possibly take in the onslaught of information from the environment, process it, and generate a response with your conscious brain alone. It needs help. And what it calls upon is a vast reservoir of unconsciously stored associations. You see, as you move through your day, your brain is constantly scanning for repeating patterns. And when it finds them, it stores them as the way things are and ought to be. But the problem with this process, which works well most of the time, is that your brain does not differentiate between the fairness, the utility, or even the accuracy of what the environment is serving up. If we perceive it out there, it gets encoded in here, and it is these associations that our brain calls upon to make sense of the world and to generate our response to it. The moment I walked onto this stage, you already had an unconscious narrative of who I am. My age, my race, my height, my topic, the way I'm dressed, all of these things went into an unconscious algorithm. We make decisions about other people in the blink of an eye based on superficial data. And that, by the way, is not a bad thing. Because biases are simply cognitive shortcuts. We could not exist without them. But the problem is that sometimes, and most of the time, those biases serve us well until they don't. And until we, they don't, and we fail to rewrite that code. So you can think about your brain as having two pathways or two tracks. One is like a superhighway on off hours with pretty much no cars on it, and it's a highway that you're familiar with. We've all had this experience. You hop on it, you get from point A to point B. It requires virtually no attention at all, right? Okay, we have a second track. It's like an overgrown pathway through the woods. It's far more interesting. But in order to get to your destination, you have to pay attention all the time. And this is a tiny track in the brain. So the brain is always going to want to default you back to the superhighway. 
in order to keep that tiny little sliver of consciousness available for those situations that call upon it. Now, let me illustrate to you just how limited this little conscious fragment is. What's two plus five? Nobody knows. <laughs> okay, what's two plus five? What's 12 plus 10? What's 96 plus 57? <laughs> Come on, guys, that's a really easy piece of, of arithmetic. But it's enough to overload your conscious brain such that you can either do that in your head or listen to me, but you're not going to be able to do both of them at the same time. So not only does your brain like to gather these associations, it likes to put them in groups such that in any given situation, we have all the associations that we need together. So for example, if you're talking about dogs, you might want to have these things ready at hand. Steering columns and windshield wipers don't belong here. So when we see, for example, went to Stanford or went to Oxford, we might think elitist or exceptionally smart. But we all know that not everybody who goes to these schools is elitist or, for that matter, exceptionally smart. To get a visceral idea of how these uh, associations work, let's do a quick little exercise. I'm going to show you some lists of words or items. And your task is going to be to name out loud the color of each item as quickly as you can. So it would look like red, green, blue, yellow, OK? So let's practice on that list, just so we're all clear on the concept. On the count of three, as quickly and accurately as you can, name the color of each item. One, two, three. OK, pretty good for after lunch. Now we're ready to go. Again? As quickly and accurately as you can, name the color. One, two, three. OK, great. List number two. As quickly and accurately as you can, name the color. One, two, three. OK, so for some of you, it got even easier the second time. And the reason is that red, the color, belongs in the same cloud as red, the word. And so you can access that information even more quickly. List number three, as quickly and accurately as you can, name the color. One, two, three. <laughs> so that was a bit harder, right? And this is because the color yellow and the word red don't belong in the same associative cloud. So your brain has to tease those two things apart and then choose one of them. And the likelihood that you're going to slow down or make an error goes way up. So with that baseline, we're ready to talk about unconscious or implicit bias. In the mid-1990s, two professors, Mazarin Banaji and Anthony Greenwald, posited for the first time that our biases might not just be a reflection of our explicit attitudes, but might also reflect these unconscious associations. And in 1997, Greenwald joined forces with Brian Nosek to devise an elegant instrument called the Implicit Association Test. And by the way, you can take this test at implicit.harvard.edu. In the case of gender, it simply asks you to associate certain words with either the face of a man or a woman. And when the requested association matches your internal association, you should be able to do the task more quickly and with fewer errors. So you might be asked to tap the E key on your keyboard if you see a face of a woman or the words supportive, gender, emotional, or fragile, or the I key with your right hand if you see the face of a man or leader, provider, strong, or driven. Most people in the population can do that task quite easily. But when we do this, just like in that third list, people slow down and they start to make errors. And the degree to which you do slow down and make errors is a measure of your unconscious associations. A few years ago, 16 million people had taken this test. And I know that the number is a lot higher now. So it's one of the largest data sets in social science. The results are quite clear. 
across, across the globe, we have very high levels of unconscious gender bias. So what are some of these biases? Well, no surprise here. Technology is associated with being male. Leadership is associated with being male. And power itself is associated with being male. But if we can find these associations in these tests, and they come from being absorbed from the environment, then we should be able to look at the environment and find the evidence. So let's go on a bit of a treasure hunt. The quickest and dirtiest way to do this is to simply do image searches on the internet. Enter a profession, <coughs> followed by image, and I took some screenshots of what shows up. CEOs, politicians, founders, computer scientists, software developers, mathematicians. Where are the women? Well, they assist the executives, they're receptionists, they're caregivers. You see where this is headed. In almost every case, those fields that involve technology and science or high-level management are the purview of men, where those fields that involve caregiving, nurturing, and support are the almost exclusive domain of women. Now, just for giggles last night, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I thought, I wonder what will come up if I put in computer coder Ruby. I kid you not, uh, this is actually what came up. And maybe there's some private joke in the community that I don't know about. But <laughs> <laughs> so we all know how capricious the internet can be when we do searches like this. So let's look at some real world examples. This is an email sent to me by LinkedIn, suggesting the top minds and big ideas that I should follow. 23 images, two are women. It's present in the notoriously lopsided gender ratios at professional conferences. This is the Wall Street Journal Digital Conference. This was the Global Leadership Summit. And check out this prophetic line from the advertising of this year's Oracle World. Now, what makes this even more poignant is that Oracle hosted a fantastic half-day session on unconscious bias, and it was sold out. So even companies that are attempting to do the right thing can inadvertently reinforce the wrong message. It's present in company events like this widely criticized frat party held at Twitter last year. It's in our news feeds. Check out the last item, key 10, element, key ele 10 key elements to dressing well for business. I clicked through, only to find out that when a new client walks through your office door, you're only as good as your suit and tie, meaning that I'm pretty much SOL. It's in headlines. Ask yourself why Fortune magazine felt it necessary to reassure us that Marissa Meyer is the real deal. Could it be that she's a blonde, attractive woman, and our unconscious associations would suggest that that might not be the case? And finally, it's even present in toys that are meant to increase gender uh, representation. This is an actual page from a booklet that accompanied computer engineer Barbie, a toy that was available for purchase in 2014. I'm only creating the design ideas, Barbie says laughing. I'll need Stephen and Brian's help to turn it into a real game. So apparently girls can be computer engineers too, as long as they have Stephen and Brian along to do the parts that involve computers. <laughs> and I love the blatant dismissal of design. I'm only coming up with the design ideas. Media is not benign, because it is this sort of imagery that our brains use in our unconscious calculations of who belongs where and what competence looks like. Now, you might be asking yourself, OK, these associations exist. I might even have them. But do they influence my behavior? And the answer, based on copious amounts of academic research, is a resounding yes, even when you don't think that it is. And the hardest hit area is in assessments of competence. And it starts early. 
A New York University study found that mothers underestimate the crawling ability of their girls and overestimate that of their boys. A Tel Aviv University study found that middle school teachers give boys more credit for equivalent answers on math exams. There have been numerous uh, pieces of research on resumes, where they send out the exact same resume but with different names or different races associated with it. A, a research from Skidmore College uh, a year ago suggested that if you put John or Jennifer on the same resume, John not only gets hired at a much higher rate, he gets about a 13% bump on his starting salary. Turning to your world, a piece of research recently came out on GitHub. Has anybody seen that? So they looked at 1.4 million GitHub users. Um, and these were people that they were able to identify their gender, not necessarily because it was in their profile on GitHub, but because they were able to cross-correlate it with their Google Plus um, profile. When they looked at acceptance rates in terms of software, uh, in terms of code, they found that women's code was accepted at about a 78.6%. Men's code was accepted at 74.6%. So 4% lower. But when they looked at whether or not you could identify the person by gender by their GitHub profile, those women that were identifiable got approved at a 62.5%. There's a lot of research that suggests that women get interrupted at a disproportionate rate, particularly in professional settings and they're likely to have their good ideas attributed to somebody else. But this has a twisted logic to it, because if we carry these unconscious associations and assessments of competence, we're much less likely to give people that we don't find to be competent airtime. And this infects women themselves. Research shows that women are likely to attribute their success to luck and to the people around them, and men are likely to attribute it to their hard work and their expertise. If you think you got to where you are, based partially on luck, you're much less likely to throw your hat into the ring for advancement. One last thing on competence is that there's a terrible double bind. Because competence and likability are positively correlated for men and negatively correlated for women. And we hire and promote based on the combination of both competence and likability. And this shows up in spades in the United States currently in our election. Finally, these biases don't just show up as discrimination against. They also show up in the life choices that we make. My favorite piece of research on this came from the University of Washington. They decorated two computer science classrooms, entry-level computer science, one with kind of neutral objects like art posters and coffee cups and plants, and the other one with more stereotypically techie, nerdy kind of things like Star Trek posters and video games and comic books, and there were also a few um, empty Coke cans littered about. Um, what they found was that female freshmen who took their class in this neutral environment expressed an equal interest in computer science as a career choice, while those who took it in this traditionally stereotypically nerdy environment expressed a markedly lower interest. For the men, it made absolutely no difference. When you really look, bias is everywhere. And believing in gender equity is not enough. Because we are the creators and the consumers of the environments that fuel this bias. And it is incumbent upon all of us to take our part in driving change. So what do we do? Well, first and foremost, male participation is critical. We can't simply leave this to women to solve. And I don't say that in any way to pick on the men in the audience, which is most of you. I say it from a few practical reasons. One is that it takes leadership to make this happen. And if the people that are sitting in those leadership positions happen to be male, well then, the gauntlet falls to them. But there's a deeper and more personal reason. And that is that it can be an incredibly isolating experience to be a woman in technology. 
Women oftentimes face biases, stereotypes, uncomfortable situations, some of them really overt, but a lot of them fairly minor, but they add up day in and day out. There's a precipitous exodus of women from technology around the 10-year mark, and it's not by accident. It's around that time that a lot of women think, well, you know, life is too short. I really don't want to spend it as an alien in a tribe where I don't belong. So it's incumbent upon all of us to fix that. So what can all of us do? Well, I think it boils down first to something very simple. I mean, my company does a lot of consulting on this issue. We help companies unravel this Gordian knot. It's very complex. But the first step is always the same, and that is to pay attention to gender representation. And it doesn't have to be some kind of onerous, politically correct task, by the way. You can have a lot of fun with it. I have a vigorous, ongoing conversation online with a lot of male colleagues, with my brother, with all sorts of people. We look for funny examples. We share them with each other. We laugh. But what it does is it raises all of our consciousness. Where do you look? Well, talks, websites, and articles, both the ones that you consume and the ones that you produce, Take a look at stock images, not only who's in the images, but what are they doing? What are the stories and examples that you use? Who are you quoting? What pronouns are you using? Look at events. Who's speaking? Who are the participants, particularly if it's by invite only? Who's on the executive committee? It can make a huge difference if you include one woman or one person of color on the executive committee in terms of the kind of representation that you get at the conference. And look at who's doing the support roles and mix it up a little bit. And by the way, I think it's appropriate to do a shout out to Simon and this conference for the incredible job that it does on representation. Finally, take a look at the workplace. What are your hiring processes? Do you use cultural fit as one of your rationale for including or excluding people? And if you do, you might want to dig into that one a little bit to see if there's some embedded biases there. Look at your decor. Look at your social activities. Do they sway only toward the, the uh, preferences of one group, or are they more equally distributed? You can't change what you can't see. No piece of legislation or mandatory sexual harassment training or quota is going to change these unconscious biases. Legislation doesn't change culture. People do. Change happens through the aggregate of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of individual actions. So what you do day in and day out matters. So this is not rocket science. But it's not easy, because paying attention to representation, even at these minor levels that I'm suggesting, takes up a little slice of your conscious bandwidth. And speaking up means stepping outside of your comfort zone and sometimes breaking step with what's otherwise a fairly comfy tribe. It's hard work, and it's easy to set it aside when you get busy doing other things, but it's work worth doing. Because until we work together to make the invisible visible, these damaging biases are here to stay. Now, I trust that the people in this room are intelligent, well-meaning, values-driven. So for the people in this room, it's not a matter of blame and shame, but it is a matter of responsibility. The stakes are high, and so is the payoff for our economies, for our businesses, for families, for 50% of the population, and for the other 50% too. Changing our societal narrative of gender is a challenge on the highest order. When I come to conferences like this, one of the most uplifting things is that invariably, I get a number of men that come up to me and say something like, you know, we're working on this at my company and I don't really know what I'm doing. It's kind of hard and we keep hitting dead ends, but I'm really committed to doing something because I think this is important. And those men become my heroes. Because it's a complex issue. There's no shrink-wrapped, one-size-fits-all answer. 
It's hard work and it's messy, but it's a mess that's worth wading into. It's worth the frustration and the distraction and the missteps because when we work together and we figure out how to undo these biases, not just for women, but for everyone, when we figure that one out, we change the world. Thank you.